The main thing that I want to say is the manuscript party scene. Even though the writing is like so luscious and very vibrant, it is also a little bit boring. I finished my shrug. I'm so happy. You can probably understand why this is like my favorite reading spot. I absolutely adore just like sitting here, reading my book, having the time of my life. That is what I'm gonna do right now for about 30 minutes before I go and meet up with my friend. But first, night out. <laughs> steps of this bag and then I'll, I can show you what it looks like and I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of my crochet journey until so far. <laughs> I've looked at my shelves and there are a couple of books that really scream to me right now and that like I need to read during this dark academia season again. Now that the sequel is out I feel a bit more inclined to pick this one up. I think it's a duology. I think so. So that's why I'm like Sabine go give it a go right now. And that is Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Like, I know it's a completely different series, but I love the Six of Crows duology so much. I thought Shadow and Bone was okay, but I do feel like Lee Bardugo is an author that I enjoy reading from. And this is her, like, first adult fiction, fantasy, murder, mystery book. I am really unclear of like what happens in this, but when I read the little synopsis, it just caught my attention and I was like, let's go. A tale of power, privilege, dark magic, and murder set among the Ivy League elite. So it takes place at Yale, I think. And there's like this magical, mysterious group of people. Our main character has been like accused of a multiple homicide, I think, but I'm like, not super sure. <laughs> Funny not to film. These three are following me. Okay, watch. They're standing still right now. <laughs> I think I've made some friends. <laughs> this little house in the forest always fascinates me. They're burning wood right now and it smells so smoky. It is time we talked about Ninth House. <laughs> Where did I even, did I bring it with me? Did I leave it upstairs? Where the frick is this book? Never mind. I put it here. I got it, look. <laughs> oh my gosh, I am like halfway through this book and loving it. It has been a while since I picked it up, but that's because I started some new crochet projects, which I will update you on in a little bit. <laughs> I'm on page 267 right now and the intrigue is coming. So I need to talk about a couple of things and I make notes about this, okay? Because I wanna, I wanna talk about it with you guys because I'm sure a lot of you have read Ninth House and want to know my thoughts on certain parts of the book. And ah, okay. <laughs> the main thing that I wanna say is the manuscript party scene. It's just that scene. That was so hot and I'm not gonna like elaborate any more on it. What I absolutely love about this book, you get like told this story in different timelines. So I think we are staying in like the same school year, but you are getting told this story like last fall, this winter, early spring. During those flashbacks to last fall, you kind of slowly get to understand what has been going on in Alex's life ever since she arrived at Yale, since she met Darlington and got introduced to these secret societies. And at the beginning of the story, you know that Darlington is missing. Darlington is gone. Everyone is being told that he's somewhere in Spain, but to be honest, 
No one knows where he is, whether he's still alive. And that is where you are during the winter timeline of this story. Alex is looking for Darlington. So many weird things have happened. This girl has been found dead at the Yale campus called Tara Hutchins. And it seems like her murder is kind of intertwined with these secret societies at Yale, but so much other weird stuff is happening. And you slowly get little bits and pieces of information when going back to last fall and seeing kind of what Alex and Darlington have been going through together and their dynamic is so good of like that enemies to lovers trope oh my gosh like darlington is just so like his ego is touched by alex coming to you with her not having a diploma her not really like knowing how to study her kind of being very lazy with stuff like that and he is just like this prep boy or at least that's how I'm imagining him in my head, like this really preppy schoolboy who knows it all, who has the biggest freaking ego. And then here comes this girl who is just like going against everything that he believes and everything that he wants. And their dynamic is so good. So like I said, that manuscript party, <laughs> if you know, you know. So now I'm kind of like at the point where a bit more investigating regarding Tara Hutchins murder is happening and also Alex is kind of using her being able to see Grey's aka Ghost's abilities for that and sometimes I'm a little bit like Alex why are you doing things you know you're not supposed to do you know you're not supposed to tell like this is gonna get back to you in a really nasty way it's all for the plot like literally Alex is like doing it for the plot. <laughs> and also at this point, Alex is slowly, I think, forming a friendship with this kind of like shy girl in her secret society, which I'm really enjoying. Loving this book. And I really, really want to get the sequel this weekend when I go to Amsterdam with a friend of mine. So let's hope that I will be able to find a matching hardcover because that is why I haven't bought it online yet because I want it to be the exact same size. In the meantime, what has been keeping me busy? I will show you. So I think I showed you that I made this like granny square toad bag handbag situation for Lexi. Immediately after that, I wanted to start another project and it has taken up so much of my time. I wanted to make like one of those bol bolero shrug situations. I don't know really what to call it, but it looked so freaking cute and it is a project that I've been meaning to do for a long time. I made the front and the back panel of the top so I can... I kind of look like Shrek. <laughs> um, so yeah, I give you guys some more updates on my Instagram with my progress regarding that. So definitely give me a follow if you want more hilarious little updates like that. But let me show you what it looks like so far because I feel like I kind of failed. Ah, oh, I think I did something wrong because that sleeve is going, it's like getting wider and wider. And even though like I do like that 70s look of like wide sleeves, there is such a thing as having too wide of a sleeve, in my opinion. Okay, so my camera died. Hence why I'm showing it to you on my phone right now. But I think this one is going a little too wide. And this is the sleeve that I have been working on since yesterday. And I feel like it fits a little bit more snugly exactly the way that I want it to. So I think I'm gonna finish the left sleeve first, really count my rows and see how it ends up looking. And then I'm gonna take out all of my work that I have done on this sleeve. <sighs> yeah, that's my little crochet update. I'm gonna go to a museum today and hopefully I will be taking you with me on my book shopping journey in Amsterdam to get Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. Okay. Oh, yeah, 
Ik heb wel een vaag idee waar dit over gaat, maar dan ja. klopt het er echt niet. Ik was vermoeid dat mijn vrouw een eten maken. Wat voor idee? Ik weet het ook niet zo goed natuurlijk. is a difficult task. Ooh. Can you see me right now? I don't know. The sun is shining like right in my face. Maybe this isn't the best angle. <laughs> Do I have a problem? Yes. And I'm literally working on my shopping therapy in therapy. <laughs> so I told you guys that I would be shopping for Hellbent in Amsterdam. Well, guess what? I failed. Not only did I fail in buying Hellbent because like no bookstore had the exact edition that I was looking for. All of them just had the paperbacks and I, I wanted to have a hardback. I did bring some gift cards with me, which is why I bought a monstrosity of books anyway. This is by the way, my roommate's room. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know that, but her room is just chef's kiss and the lighting is like way better over here. So that's why like I spend most of my time in her room actually. <laughs> and she's also my best friend, so. Just saying, just saying. As you saw, Kim and I went to a ton of bookstores. I love that I have friends that I can share my hobbies with, especially Kim. Like Kim and I, we we both crochet. We both go book shopping a lot and like to read. And we also like to go out and drink cocktails and you know, you get the best of both worlds. We went together to Waterstones, but also to the American Book Center, which is I think possibly maybe my favorite bookstore in Amsterdam, as well as Scheltema, which I went there for the first time. They had some really good books over there, like even signed editions, as you saw. Let's start with the two books that I bought at Waterstone. So first off, I got, oh my God, The Fragile Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab. <laughs> I have to say, I'm just really, really bad at the moment with keeping up to date with what are the new books that are being released because I have not been that active in the book community over the past months. So when I found out that the new book in the Darker Shade of Magic spin-off series was coming out, I was freaking out. I was like, that's my favorite trilogy of all time. And I didn't even know that kind of like book number four or book one in a new trilogy was coming out. Like what kind of a fan am I? All that I know is that this book and this story takes place seven years after the original trilogy ended. I do have to say it's been three years or something since I last read book three in the series. So I do want to read a good recap of the things that happened in it. I am just obsessed with The Darker Shade of Magic and I'm so happy that Kim actually bought that book in the bookstore. I was like, you have to read it. It's about parallel Londons, people who can travel between the parallel worlds and our main character who can do exactly that takes an artifact with him, which is totally illegal and just bad shit happens from that moment on. It features worlds without magic like ours. It features a world where magic is celebrated, a world where magic is very dark and one world where you just don't know what Ooh, oh my gosh <laughs> oh my gosh i hope you're okay maybe it's my enthusiasm about a darker shade of magic that just like made you fall over i don't know <laughs> basically read the damn book let me get a little sip of my tea mm -mm -mm. Love me a good chai. So at Waterstones, which I always like to do in a bookstore, by the way, is try to explore titles or books that you've never heard of. And I saw this, the title intrigued me, the synopsis intrigued me, the Goodreads reviews were really amazing. And that is The People on Platform 5 by Claire Pooley, I think is how you pronounce this author's name. The line, like it's so boring actually, but I don't know why this intrigues me so much that really got me was nobody speaks to strangers on the train. What would happen if they did? I keep on getting stuck to this plant. <laughs> Every day at 8.05, Iona Iverson boards the train to go to work. As a seasoned commuter, there are rules to follow. You must have a job to go to, 
don't consume hot food, never speak to strangers on the train. Iona sees the same group of people each day, people she makes assumptions about and gives nicknames to, but never ever talks to. Then one morning, smart but sexist Surbiton chokes on a grape right in front of Iona. Too good to be true, new Malden saves his life, and this one event sparks a chain reaction. With nothing in common but their commute, an electric group of people learn that their assumptions about each other don't match reality. But when Iona's life begins to fall apart, will her new friends be there when she needs them most. I think why it intrigued me so much is just because I recently went on a solo trip to Prague and definitely watch that video if you haven't already. I love the vlog that I made for it, but I've never talked to more strangers in my life than in Prague when I was by myself. And I think just strangers in general and having good profound conversations with just people that you barely know, it just fascinates me a lot and I love human connection. So I think that, that is why I picked up this book and I don't know if there there is gonna be like some magical realism or kind of just like a surreal weird element in this book. It's, it sounds like it, but I'm not 100% sure of whether this is just fiction or like speculative, I cannot even say that word, speculative fiction. I'm just very intrigued. So I've never heard anyone talk about it. Let me know if you know more about this book or whether you've read it and have an opinion. And yesterday I went to my old work. I still had a gift voucher to spend from when I left there. This is a new release that I've heard like everyone and their mama talk about. It is a stunning cover. The genre seems amazing and okay, let's just show it to you guys. It is Starling House by Alexis E. Harrow. I've never read a book by Alexis E. Harrow, but I've heard so many people rave about the thousand Doors of January book, I think, that she wrote. Apparently this is like a gothic horror book with a creepy, mysterious house. It just sounds absolutely fantastic. Step into Starling House if you dare. Nobody in Eden remembers when Starling House was built, but the town agrees it's best to let this ill-omened house and its last lonely heir go to hell. Okay. <laughs> Opal knows better than to mess with haunted houses or brooding men, but when an opportunity to work there arises, the money might get her brother out of Eden. Starling House is uncanny and full of secrets, like Arthur its heir. It also feels strangely, dangerously, like something she's never had, a home. Yet Opal isn't the only one interested in the horrors and wonders that lie buried beneath it. And when dark forces converge on Eden, Opal realizes that if she wants a home, she'll have to fight for it. She may even have to go deep down beneath Starling House to claw her way back into the light. I'm sorry, but how freaking intriguing does that sound? And the last one that I got is a book that I've been eyeing for the past couple of months whenever I walk into a bookstore, and that is The Book Eaters by Sunji Dean. And I think it is a horror novel about people who literally consume books. Hidden across England and Scotland live six old book eater families. The last of their lines, they exist on the fringes of society and subsist on a diet of stories and legends. Children are rare and their numbers have dwindled. So when Devon Fairweather's second child is born, a dreaded mind eater, a provision of her own kind, who consumes not stories but the minds and souls of humans, she flees before he can be turned into a weapon for the family or worse. Living among humans and finding prey for her son, Devon seeks a cure for his hunger, but time is running out for her family want her back, and with every soul her son consumes, he loses a little more of himself. I am just so intrigued and the premise sounds very, very unique. So these are the four books that I bought in Amsterdam instead of just getting Hellbent, which I did also order online right now because, because I couldn't find the copy. Oh my gosh, I am so, so fucked. <laughs> but let's, let's finish reading Ninth House, shall we, before I can continue Hellbent. And um, I hope I can add that book as one of my new favorite reads of this year. It is so gloomy outside, but I don't know how else to show you, but look, I finished. I finished my shrug. I'm so happy. The immediate thought that I have whenever finishing a project is like, what do I do next? What do I spend all of my free time on? Now that I have finished this project, I can finally finish reading Ninth House because in my head, it's either I crochet or I read a book and I cannot do it at the same time, which is kind of logical, but some people listen to audiobooks. I just cannot focus on my audiobook whenever I crochet because I do have to keep track of the rows and make sure it's looking good. But I think that it looks perfect.
the houses of the Vale. The ancient. Oh my god, what a sentence to close off this book. <laughs> I'm so glad that the things have been revealed in the last chapter that I have been like denying certain bits of information that have been revealed like in this book and now the ending is kind of like making it all a bit okay. Let me go to my appointment and I will give you a more in-depth analysis of my thoughts on the second half of the book because they're a little less positive than the first one. finally done <laughs> with my current read and I'm so happy because I can close off this vlog because I feel like I've been boring you for way too long already. So I finished Gallant listening to the audiobook because uh, I, uh, wait, I still need to give a ninth house update first. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay, wait, let's do that first because I, I didn't even tell you my final thoughts on the book. So ninth house first, the book. In total, I would give a solid 4.25 out of five stars. It was so highly enjoyable, highly entertaining. I really loved the dark atmosphere of Yale and its secret societies and kind of like what each society stood for, what they did, what kind of magic they had and morally great characters. Amen to that. Amen. However, the second part of the book, I liked it a little bit less than the first one. And without giving away like any spoilers, I think it was because one of the perspectives, like Darlington's perspective got lost throughout the half of the book. And I just really liked reading from his perspective and getting to know his background. And I, like I said, loved the relationship between Alex and um, Darlington. Wow, I forgot his name for a second. <laughs> Some of the reveals in the end were kind of expected for me or they just didn't make that much of an impression. So not disappointed. I'm not. It's just not like it didn't go out with a bang as much as it started with a bang for me personally. And after that, I picked up Gallant by V.E. Schwab. This is one of my favorite authors. I absolutely adore A Darker Shade of Magic, that trilogy and Vicious. And this book has been on my TBR for a long time. It is very short, but it has taken me like two to three weeks to finish it. I don't even remember the main character's name. I just finished it. Okay, Gallant is about Olivia, our 16 year old main character. I do have to say she read a little bit younger though sometimes, but she has grown up in this children's home and feels very alone, doesn't know anything about her family, only that her parents are both gone. And the only thing that she has left from, especially her mother, is her diary telling stories about her father, but Olivia is oblivious. Until one day at her like school for girls that she like lives in, um, like a letter arrives there from her uncle asking her to come to Gallon, this like huge, mysterious, dark estate and to live with him. And she's like, yes, of course I'm gonna do that. <laughs> However, Olivia sees ghouls. Like she can see ghosts, which is very funny because in Ninth House, our main character can like do the same thing. And there are just like lots of mysterious, creepy things happening at Gallant and Olivia has to promise the people there that she's not gonna go beyond the wall. Like that sounds really mysterious and you will slowly find out in this book what's going on with the wall, what is going on with Olivia's family and like why she is invited there. The thing is though, even though the writing is like so luscious and very vibrant and like you can picture everything super clearly because V.E. Schwab does that with her writing, it is also a little bit boring and repetitive, <laughs> especially since I thought personally the plot was not super, super strong. Like if you don't wanna know anything about my more elaborate thoughts of this book, then click away. At the start of this book, like Olivia's character is like painted very well of her being at this school and like the trauma that she has gone through with her missing family, but also the big bullies at her school because she is like mute, is that how you say it? Like she cannot speak. So when she receives the letter from her uncle, like she feels all this warmth of like, I wanted to say newfound family, but it's like her actual family and she wants to belong so bad. The whole creepy vibes of this house and there being like a different world kind of that Olivia visits made me think that this book is like perfect for people who love Stranger Things and The Haunting of Hill House. I feel like this book is a 
an exact match of those two shows. However, some scenes felt very repetitive. And even though this is just 300 pages, I felt like this could have been shrunk into at least like 250, 200 pages maybe. And I feel like the story and the bittersweet ending would have made an even better impact. At the end, I was a little bit clueless. Like, um, how is Olivia's family connected to Gallant and to this house and everything that's happening beyond the wall? It was kind of huh? so slight disappointment for this one would give it a three out of five stars. Thank you so much for being on this journey with me. This reading vlog took two freaking months to make. Oh, thank you so much for being here and for always supporting me. It means so much. And hopefully I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.